Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is the truth. Thank you for it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation. Thank you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We began sharing with you today on a series that we're going to be bringing forth on conquering the lies of the devil that would try to come against you. And we pointed out he is a liar. The truth is not in him. We also pointed out the fact that as we get the word in us, and we walk in the truth, we'll see God accomplish what He purposes for us. We pointed out the fact that anything that's contrary to the Word is a lie. We must have the Word, speak it, do it, walk in it, think upon it, obey it. As we do so, then we're going to be in line with the truth. We see what the enemy does, and we begin here in Romans 1.25. We saw this this morning. This is what he will try to do to change the truth of God into a lie, because he's against everything that is the truth, which is the Word of God, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. Well, we're but he's serving God, not ourselves. He wants to turn everything away from the way of the Lord. You cannot allow that to happen. How are you going to be able to do that? We well, got to know, you have to have knowledge of the truth. And we talked about that extensively this morning. As we get the knowledge of God, precise, correct knowledge of the truth, then we will not be deceived by the lie that the enemy would bring. It's important that we put God's Word first place so that we can overcome all enemies. We did see that we need to receive the knowledge of God and not reject it. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. He wasn't pleased with them. Why? Because there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. And why was that? Not because it can't, didn't come to them. It's because of what they did with it when it came to them. And what's the result if we don't have the knowledge of God, which means we're following a lie? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge. It came to them, but they rejected it. This is why we need to accept the love of the truth, accept the Word of God, and never reject the knowledge of God. Because of that, he said, I will also reject thee. We need to put God's Word first place. And another scripture we saw, which is important, as we get the Word in us, we get the knowledge of God, and we do what it says, then we will not be yielding to the lies that the enemy brings. And we can only overcome the enemy's lies by the Word of God, the Word of Truth. John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, that's abiding, continuing in it, then are you my disciples indeed, which is a disciplined one, because you're hearing and doing it. The result being, and you shall know the truth, meaning you aren't really not going to know the truth until you've become disciplined in doing the word. And what will the truth do? The truth shall make you free. Not only will you walk in the ways of the Lord, but it will produce not only revelation to you, but it will produce the making you free in your life. Well, we must conquer all attacks of the enemy. And we're going to do those things by the Word of God. How did Jesus deal with every attack that came against him? He did it with the Word of God. Here was his answer to the temptation that came. In Matthew 4, 4, he answered and said, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was after the devil came as a tempter to tell him that if you be the Son of God, command the stones be made bread. He gave the answer to the temptation. What you're going to speak or what you're going to do or what you're going to think upon is what the Word says in the face of any lie that the enemy would bring against you. That's how you're going to overcome everything that comes at you. We're going to be bringing a lot of practical things and giving scriptures that answer those things because the devil will bring these kind of lies to you. One of them is a common one. He brings to people is that you're insignificant, you're not important to God, and God doesn't really think too much of you. People fall for that lie and think that God doesn't really need me. That's a lie. What's going to be the answer for that? 
1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 20. You have to know what the Word says to answer every lie. 1 Corinthians 12, 20, Now are they many members, talking about the body, yet one body. And then he says, The eye, that's one of the members of the body, cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor, again, the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Well, think about it. who's the head of the body. It's Jesus. He's the head of the church, because the church is the body of Christ. So, Jesus says to the feet, he doesn't say to the feet, I have no need of you. He does need us. He wants to use you. He wants to do a work in your life. He wants to accomplish his will, and he wants to use you to minister for him, to serve him and carry out the work of God that he calls you to do. Every one of us has a ministry. So don't ever believe the lie that thinks that you're not important or you're not significant to God or you know, it doesn't matter about you. Not so. Every one of you are important, and you must get the truth and not believe any lies that would try to deceive you. Another one is thinking that, well, God's really not with you to manifest himself in your life. Well, that's a lie. You need to know what the truth says. You need to realize that what happened to you when you got born again? Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known what's the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is the one who accomplished the salvation for mankind, and he's come into you when you received him because you have a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. So you're not alone. He is on the inside of you. He is the one who is going to manifest himself as you walk in his ways. And the one who's in you is greater than the enemies. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, You're of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You've got to realize the greater one's on the inside of you. So you're able to overcome in every situation. You can overcome anything that would try to come against you from the devil, because the greater one is living in you. And you are an overcomer, you're a conqueror, you're to be completely victorious in every situation. Also, God not only comes to dwell in you as the greater one, as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Of course, the answer being none. For you are the temple of the living God. He's come to dwell in you. As God has said, I will dwell in them. So God's dwelling in you, but he wants to do more than that and walk in them. He's coming to dwell in you and then to walk in you as he's leading you and guiding you as you're following the way of the word to accomplish his work in you and through you. He said, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And he will manifest himself greatly to you. Now, you must also realize that when you got born again, that you now have a brand new spirit. And one of the lies that has been taught widely in the body of Christ is that you are a sinner and that you got saved by grace, but you're still a sinner and you're still going to sin. Is that true? Not so. It is a false teaching. How are you going to know the answer? It's the word. So you can't fall for that lie. There's multitudes of Christians out there that think that they're still a sinner and that they're always going to sin and they can't overcome all sin in their life. It's not true. Look what it says in Romans 6, 2. And you got to know what the scripture says to answer the lies. How shall we that not are dead to sin, but actually this is a word telling us what happened. We died to sin. It's a verb. We died to sin, as Young's brings out. How did you die to sin? When you got a brand new spirit. You got a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. So how can you live any longer therein? Otherwise, we shouldn't be living any longer in it since we died to sin. Verse 7 says, For he not that is dead, are we dead? No. He that, as you see what this, this means, has died. It's telling you what happened to you. It's an aorist tense. He who has died, as Young's brings out, what's happened because you died. 
It says, you have been freed from sin. When I put the cursor over the word freed, this is a word which is in a perfect tense, which is important to realize to understand what's being said. The perfect tense in the Greek shows forth completed action in the past with present effects at the time of speaking. Meaning, you who died, you have been set free in the past with the present effects now from what? From sin. Meaning, you've been set free from sin. So therefore, why would we still be a sinner? We're not one. It's a lie. It's a false teaching. We come down to verse 17. God be thanked you were the servants of sin. You were under bondage to it. But you've obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine was delivered you. What was that? Receiving Jesus and getting born from above. And what happened? Being then made free from sin. Why are you free from sin? Because the old you died and you got a brand new you on the inside of you. And what did you become? You became servants of righteousness. Are we a servant of sin? No, we're not a servant of sin any longer. We're a servant of righteousness. How? Because we have a brand new spirit on the inside of us. And he speaks here. He says in verse 20, you were the servants of sin when you had a spirit that was a sinner spirit. You were free from righteousness. What fruit had you in the things you're now ashamed? End of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, which we are, become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness and end everlasting life. Now this is important because if you don't realize that you have been set free from sin, the old you died and you got a brand new spirit, you have been freed from sin, you'll never take a stand against conquering all sin in your life. And you and I can conquer all sin. He wants us to conquer every bit of sin and to walk in holiness and be righteous, be in righteousness before him. Sin has no more dominion over you. And so you must overcome that lie. Many people think that, well, we're just always going to sin, you know. No, we don't have to sin. In fact, we're not supposed to sin. In fact, God has even commanded us not to sin. He says here in verse 12, this is a command. This isn't like a nice suggestion. Let not sin reign. When it talks about this, this is a command to you and me because it's an imperative mood. It is essentially saying, do not let sin reign in your mortal body as a command. It kind of gets watered down by saying, let not sin. But it's a command in the present tense. Do not let sin continually, ongoingly, reign in your mortal body. And how would you let it reign? If you obey it in the lust thereof, which is coming from the flesh. Well, you're, it, what dwells in the flesh? Sin dwells in the flesh. But how about your spirit? There's no sin in your spirit. Your spirit is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Therefore, you're not a sinner any longer. And you do not left, you are commanded to not let sin reign in you. Also, you're commanded about your members. That would be all your faculties. He says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. The word here for yield, this again is a command. This is not just try your best. No, it's a command to you and me ongoingly. It essentially says, do not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. God would never command us to do something if we couldn't do it. And the reason he commands us is because you've been set free from sin. You're not a sinner any longer. So the lie that you've been taught, wherever you've been, because it's been taught widely, I'm sure you've heard it, that we're still a sinner, we're a sinner saved by grace and that we'll all still sin, it's a lie. Instead, you got your the old you died and you got a brand new you on the inside of it. Now what goes along with that is people think, well, I'll just try and do my very best. And so they try to resist sin, but you know, they figure, well, if I sin, you know, I can, I can always repent tomorrow. And they don't really take a stand against it, thinking that, you know, I'm always going to sin. Well, that's a mistake. If you sin 
just confessing your sin is not going to solve the whole problem. Why? Because you must understand the effects of what sin will do to you. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So sin hardens you. It hardens you in your heart. That's not, confession of sin is not going to get rid of all that effect. It has caused a hardening in you, and it's going to affect you adversely. What else does happen when you sin? You're going to let demons come into you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. You're going to have a negative effect from sin, see? When it says, neither give place to the devil, this is following verse 26, where it says, be angry and sin not. This is talking about a righteous anger, not out of the flesh, out of, the, out of yourself or your mind, but over an injustice done according to the word of God. At the same time, so it would be a righteous anger, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Even if it's a righteous anger, you can't let it continue on beyond that day. Because if you do, you'll be sinning. Now, if, you, if you're in sinning, what's going to happen? Then it tells you, neither give place to the devil. This word place means a place of residence. What will happen if you sin? You give a place of residence to the devil. And what will happen? The demons will come into you. And you will have evil spirits that are going to be in you. And just confession of sin isn't going to get rid of the demons. Now you're going to have to cast out the demons. And they're going to have an effect upon you as well. Also, if we walk in sin, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 tells us, if we sin willfully, otherwise we know what we're doing, after we receive the precise, correct knowledge of the truth, otherwise we know what the truth is, we have the knowledge of God, and we didn't do what the Word says. We instead sinned willfully. What happens? In the Old Testament, he's speaking to the Hebrews here, and he said, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, which is what they would do to get covered over the sins in the Old Testament. But what's going to happen? He's telling them, no, there's a certain fearful looking for of judgment. In other words, when we sin, there will be an effect. It will be a judgment that will come upon us. Because when you obey, you're going to be blessed. But when you disobey, curses will come. That's according to spiritual law. And evil spirits will come into you. Also, you can lose anything that you've gained if you go back into sin. In John chapter 5, verse 14, this is the man who got healed. And apparently he, his problem was because of his sins initially, because afterwards Jesus finds him in the temple in John 5, 14, and he said, Behold, you're made whole. Behold, thou art made whole. He was healed now. And then he tells him, Sin no more, meaning that must have been what caused his problem to begin with. And now he's telling him, Don't continue in sin, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Well, he if he his sins, is not going to have any adverse effect? No, he's going to be in worse shape the next time. His sickness or disease will get worse. And the same thing is true is regarding casting out demons. If we have cast out demons even, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man because it's been cast out, he walks through dry places, or passes through, it means, seeking rest, finding none. He's trying to find somebody to go into. Then he says, I'll return to my house. Who's his house? The one he came out of, which is the person he was cast out of. From whence I came out. And when he's come, if he finds it empty, swept, and garnished, otherwise it was cast out, but nothing was filled up to keep the enemy out. Because you need to fill yourself up with the Word of God so you don't give place to the sin and allow the enemies to come back in. What's going to happen? Then goes he and takes with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. In other words, if we go back into sin, not only the spirit that came out is going to come back in, but he's going to bring seven more wicked than himself. They enter in there and dwell there, and the last state of the man will be worse than the first. We cannot allow 
ourselves to walk in sin. Why is that? We don't have to because we have a brand new spirit. Sin has no dominion over us. You can conquer all sin in your life. So any lies or thoughts thinking that, well, you know, everybody sins, and thinking that, well, if I sin, you know, I can always confess my sin and everything will be fine again. No, there's effect of sin. It hardens your heart. Demons come in. You'll get worse. You'll lose what you've gained. You'll have more demons come in or worse situation instead. So what are we to do? Hebrews chapter 12. Any thought that comes to you thinking that, well, if I sin, I can always confess it and I'll be okay. That's a lie. What's the attitude you must have against sin, knowing the effects that it's going to do? Hebrews 12, 4, he said, You've not yet resisted unto blood, striving, struggling, fighting against sin. Well, I mean, this is pretty intense. If I'm resisting unto blood, I've yet to see anybody resisting sin and blood dropping off of them. <laughs> that shows you really need to be fighting against this. You have not resisted yet striving against sin. God wants you to struggle and fight against sin. You are not going to let it have place in you because that's how the enemy will come in. Evil spirits will come in, and of course, you won't be right with God whatsoever. We look over in 1 John. You must understand that God does not want you walking in any sin. 1 John 3, 6, Whosoever abideth in him does not continually sinning. This is a present tense. If you're abiding in Him, which means you're walking in His Word, you're not going to be sinning anymore. Because you're not to be sinning anymore. You're to conquer all sin in your life. We don't have to sin. We're not a servant of it any longer, remember. We're not in bondage to it. Whosoever sinneth has not seen Him, neither known Him. I mean, they haven't realized what has happened on the inside of them. You are to walk free from all sin. And another scripture in 1 John that's important to look at, chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God is not sinning anymore. Now, this is interesting because the word born here is not a noun saying it's born like an occurrence of something that happened. This is a verb, perfect tense verb, meaning we know that whosoever has been born as far as a in the past being perfect tense is what it's talking about with present results at the time of speaking remember that's what the perfect tense mean so what does that imply that implies the guy got born again in the past but also there's an ongoing effect of that now which means he's now walking in the ways of the word of god and if he is doing that, he's not sinning any longer. What does he do? Because, but the, he that's begotten of God, he's keeping himself. He's guarding himself. He's not going to let himself sin any longer. Because the devil's trying to get to him, of course. He's going to keep himself, and the wicked one touches him not. Who's the wicked one? It's the devil. And what is he coming to do? He's trying, ongoingly, present tense, to get to you. And because it's a middle voice, means the wicked one would touch him for himself to bring destruction against you. He wants to come and bring destruction in some manner. Comes to steal, to kill, destroy in some way. Well, what are you going to do? You've been born again in the past with present results now. You're walking in line with the Word of God. You are guarding yourself ongoingly so you don't yield to any sin in your life so that anyone, enemy, cannot get to you any longer. Now, it, also, the devil will say, well, if you sin, you know, just kind of keep it to make sure nobody finds out. Well, is that going to help you? No. You're still going to have an effect. Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. He's talking to them here about how they're to go and fight the fight, go armed to drive out all the enemies. And he says, if the land be subdued before the Lord afterward, you'll return, be guiltless before the Lord, because they obeyed him. 
and the land would be their possession. And he says, but if you will not do so, if you won't do what God says, behold, you've sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. That means you're not going to be able to cover up anything. Any sins that we've committed, our sins will, our sin, you'll be found out. You won't get away from anything whatsoever. And you think that the Lord doesn't see things? He sees everything. Proverbs, other people may not know, but God knows. Proverbs 15, verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He sees the evil and he sees the good. Anything that somebody is doing that they think that, well, nobody else sees, God sees. Nobody's getting away from anything whatsoever. And what's going to happen? All of the things that we have done, there's going to be a judgment for it. Even the secret things that nobody else knows but God. We see it's over in Ecclesiastes. At Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. God shall bring every work into judgment, whether it's good or bad, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Otherwise, nobody else knows, but it, God knows, and you're still going to have a judgment coming. So you're not going to get away. People don't get away with anything, even if nobody else knows about it whatsoever. And he will judge those who are not who have tried to cover over their sin or maybe no one else has known about it. We see the same thing said in Romans 2.16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So don't think anybody's getting away with anything. They aren't. And you won't get it, or I won't get away with anything either. <laughs> we got to make sure that we're not doing things uh, that are sinful and think that uh, we might get away with it. No. And then another thing that comes to people, they'll try to justify their sin. And they'll say, well, everybody else is doing it. Or everybody else, or other people are doing worse than me. <laughs> you know, trying to kind of justify their self. That's not going to work whatsoever. Because it doesn't matter what kind of a sin you're doing. God is going to see that sin and it is going to affect you. It doesn't, don't compare yourself and try to justify you know, yourself because I'm not as bad as that person over there. <laughs> That's not going to work. That's the enemy trying to deceive you. Look what it says in Isaiah 59 too. Your iniquities are separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he'll not hear. It doesn't matter what kind of a sin it is. It's not so bad. Uh, it's, still, it's still having this effect. He's going to hide his face from you. He's not going to hear you. You've actually separated yourself from him. We have to make sure that we're not giving place. And people think that, well, maybe God will just kind of overlook mine. No, he won't overlook them whatsoever. In fact, we even saw that scripture in Acts chapter 17 previously. Verse 30, the times of this ignorance God winked at but not anymore. In the New Testament now, we have a brand new spirit. We don't have a sinner spirit. We are not to have any sin in our life whatsoever. God's command all men everywhere to repent. Everyone. And he's no respecter of persons. He doesn't have favorites or think that, well, I'll let this person slide. No, nobody slides. Colossians chapter 3, verse 25 makes it clear. He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. Everybody's going to re reap what they sow. And there is no respect of persons. God is just. God is fair. And he's going to do what's right. He will bless those that do right. And judgment will come upon those that do not do right. We've got to make sure that we're walking in the ways of the Lord. And we can't be those who are following after what other people? Everybody else does it, you know. <laughs> oh, that's not going to work. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. 
In fact, you're not supposed to be like the many. You're supposed to be like the few. It tells us in Matthew 7, 13, enter in at the straight gate. This is the narrow gate. The word stenos meaning narrow. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. These are the ones that are just walking however they want. They're not overcoming sin. They're going the way of destruction. Because narrow, stenos is the gate. And this word narrow is not, shouldn't be translated that way. It's the word thibo, meaning pressed. Pressed is the way that is leading unto life. And who's finding it? You. You want to be one of the few, not one of the many. Only the few are entering in. We cannot think that we're going to be get any special favors or whatever all. No, it's not going to happen. In fact, you're not going to be able to rest on your past laurels of the good things you've done either if you turn away and you walk contrary to the word. Look what it says down here in verse 22. Here's another one about the many. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? These are Christians born again who had a gift of prophecy and were prophesying. In thy name have cast out devils. These are people that understood they had authority over demons and were casting the demons out. In thy name done many wonderful works. They were serving God. Well, did they continue that way? <clears throat> no. Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Now, why would that be? Because they weren't walking in the ways of the Lord any longer. Depart from me, because now what were they doing? You who are working ongoingly, present tense, continually, anomia, which is the word meaning lawlessness. They are working lawlessness. Well, is God, you know, about all the things I did in the past. I serve God. I work for God. All these kind of things. That won't work. It's what you're doing continuously that counts. Now, people will say, oh, well, you know, everything's okay because you've been serving God in the past. No, not so. Look what it says here in Ezekiel 18. Beginning in verse 21. If the wicked will turn from all his sins that he's committed, he's not sinning anymore, and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, so he's now doing the word, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Well, that's good. He's, he's not going to be wiped out. He's going to have life. He's going to come forth, be saved. All his transgressions that he was doing in the past, that he's committed, they shall not be, when it's, the word mentioned means remembered or recalled. It's as if they're gone unto him. In his righteousness that he's done, he shall live. Well, that's good news. All the sins of the past that he's done because he's changed and now he's walking in righteousness, they won't be remembered. But what about the guy who was serving the Lord? That would be someone who was doing righteousness. He was doing what God wanted. Here it talks about this kind of guy. When the righteous, the guy who is one of the many, doing all the things he was doing, turns away from his righteousness, as we see what was in verse 23 of Matthew 7, where now he's working lawlessness, and is committing iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations the wicked man doeth, shall he live? The answer is no. All his righteousness, all the things he did in the past, that he has done shall not be remembered or recalled. It's as if they never happened. In his trespass that he has trespassed, in his sin that he has sinned, and them shall he die. That tells you something. God knows you what you're walking after on an ongoing basis. Those who are now working lawlessness, as we saw, he's, he heard them say, depart from me. Same thing over in Luke. Luke chapter 13, this is the case where these ones were not walking in the ways of the Lord anymore. They were at one time, they'd been in his presence. They talked about here, we've eaten and drunk in your presence. You taught in our streets. They heard his word. They were in the presence of God. 
But he says, I tell you, I know you not from, from where, whence means from where you are at the present time, because he knows you off what you're doing. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, and this is the word which means unrighteousness. Well, they were workers of unrighteousness, which is sin. Meaning, if you're walking in the ways of sin, what are you going to hear? Depart from me. If you're working lawlessness, what are you going to hear? Same thing. Depart from me. What does that show us? We cannot allow ourselves to continue to walk in any kind of sin whatsoever. Because if you go back, if you start walking in a different way, a lawless way, and you continue in that, now... He, all the things you did in the past, he's not going to remember them anymore. He's only going to see you by what you're walking after continually. That is so important. God wants you to conquer all sin in your life. Anything that gives you an excuse or try to reason in your mind that, you know, about sinning, it's all a lie from the devil. You're dead to sin, you're alive to God, you're commanded not to sin any longer whatsoever. Now, other people say, well, you know, my conscience really isn't bothering me even though I'm doing these things. <laughs> well, they think that that means there's nothing wrong with them? No. Your conscience can be destroyed because of the things you have done. Look what it says in Titus 1.15. Under the pure, all things are pure, and unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Their conscience is defiled. And they don't even have a consciousness of doing what's right anymore. It can, it can take that type and effect upon you. So people that, you know, say, wouldn't his conscience be smiting him and showing him he's doing the wrong thing? Not if he's gone down this road and got defiled to the point where his conscience is totally shot, defiled. Oh, that's going to be someone who is going to be totally deceived. In fact, we even see what it talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, where it speaks about, in the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing or deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. What else? Speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. <laughs> oh, their conscience now is shot. It's been destroyed because of all the evil that they're doing. That means that even though someone doesn't have a conscience of being convicted of something, I've heard people say that, if it, God's looking at your works. He's looking at what you're doing. He's looking at your actions. If you're walking in sin and your conscience has gotten so bad, you're still in trouble and you're still gonna see tremendous judgment. Now other people sit there and think, well, I am guilty of sin, so I'm always going to be condemned. I can't get anywhere. No, don't believe that. That's another lie the devil will bring to people and think that you're, you're always going to be condemned because of what you did. John chapter 8. This is the woman who was taken in the very act of adultery. What does it say about her? Remember that they came and they wanted Jesus to see the judgment come on her, which was she was supposed to be stoned. And he said, Who's he without sin cast the first stone? <laughs> of course, none of them could do that because they all had sin. Well, under the law, they were supposed to stone. Was Jesus following the Old Testament law? No. He didn't have any sin. Did he obey what the Old Testament law said? No. He didn't stone them whatsoever. In fact, after they all left, he said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? No. She said, no man, Lord. And then Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. He didn't come to condemn. Instead, he said, go and sin no more. Don't think that you're under condemnation and he's going to judge you and you're not going to be able to get out of your situation because of the things you've done in the past. Don't believe that. Doesn't matter what you've done in the past, you can confess your sin God will forgive you and cleanse you. The big thing is stop sinning from now on. 
Go and sin no more and walk in the ways of the Lord. That is so important. We think also about people that think my past is so bad. Well, think about Paul. If anybody had a past that was bad, Paul had a bad past. Acts chapter 7, verse 58. This is when Paul was there, when Stephen was being stoned. When they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. His name was Saul, who later called Paul. He was there and involved in the murder of him. He did an evil thing. Chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was consenting unto his death. He's a murderer. At that time, it was a great persecution against the church. And, of course, he was involved in bringing that forth. Saul, he made havoc to the church, of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. This guy did a lot of evil things. Saul, in verse chapter 9, yet breathing and threatening slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest. I mean, this guy was so zealous to try to destroy them all. Desired him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And, and that's when, of course, he was going his way to do that. He did a lot of evil things. Even when he wrote to the Galatian church, he said in Galatians 1.13, You've heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. I mean, this guy did a lot of evil things. He destroyed it, brought destruction. Prophet in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But then we see what happened. In 1 Timothy, see, did he have, was he right with God at all? No. He was run by the devil. 1 Timothy 1.13. He speaks of how he, before he was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. But also, could he come to the place where he didn't have a consciousness of all the things that he did and be under a judgment because of all the evil that he did in the past? Yeah. Because look at the statement he makes here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We've corrupted no man. We've defrauded no man. That sounds like a lie. He wronged a whole lot of people. <laughs> well, why is this so? Because of the fact that he's brand new on the inside. He's turned away from all the evil ways. And so therefore, he's not under the judgment. You confess your sins, you repent, you turn away from things, you can be forgiven, you can be cleansed, you can be set free from all the bondages and not under a judgment. Therefore, you've got to realize that it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It matters what you do from now on. Don't let the past, the devil, beat you over the head over your past and the bad things that you've done. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. It's a new day. You walk in God's ways from now on and you'll be like the guy who doesn't remember their sins any longer. You walk uprightly before him and you're going to see God bring a, tr a tremendous work. Look at Paul. Paul's the one who got all the revelation and wrote the new t most of the New Testament. This guy saw tremendous things happen. If God can use Paul, who had a terrible past, he can use you. So don't ever let the past pull you down. I've had people say, well, I've just been too bad of a person in the past. That's why some reason why people think they can't get saved. I've just been too bad. I've done too many bad things. Not so. Or even when they, after they were born again, you can be forgiven and cleansed. Don't let anything come in your mind that will bring any lies to try to make you think that you can't be forgiven. But of course, you have to meet the conditions, remember. Hebrews 8, 
verse 12 tells us this. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. His mercy is available. And their sins and their iniquities, all their lawlessness, will I remember no more. Is that automatic because you've been born again? No. How do you know that? I mean, this will happen, but it is a conditional statement when it says remember here. This is a subjunctive mood verb, which means he might remember, he might not remember their sins and iniquities anymore, assuming they've, assuming they've met conditions, which is what? Turn away from them, of course. Confess your sin, repent, turn away, and not walk in them any longer. God wants you to understand that if you've turned away from them, he's not going to remember them anymore. So you don't let the devil beat you down with negative thoughts about the past. Things you did or things you didn't do, he'll try to barrage you with these things, and these are all lies of the devil to wear you down and make you think that you can't serve God or do what God wants or he's not going to be favorable towards you or his mercy won't be available. It's all lies. You need to overcome anything that comes in your mind from the past. If you're walking in the way of the Lord and you truly have confessed your sins, God will turn everything around in your life. And that is so important. Let's talk about another area where the enemy tries to bring lies. And I've seen people do, have this all the time. It's on, on being healed. They think, well, there's people in the Bible that didn't get healed, so I guess that's why God hasn't healed me yet. And I don't know if he'll heal me for sure or not. Here's a case. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. Erasmus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus of I left it, my lead him sick. He didn't get healed, he was sick. So he left him there. Well, does that mean the fact that not everybody can be healed then? No, it has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Or people bring up a, 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 a Joe or a Paul who had an eye thing for a season. We don't know how long, but nonetheless, he, he had a problem with his eyes. We see also, we talk about Job, where Job did have the sore boils that Satan he smote him with. Although he did get blessed in the end and recover everything. But because these guys all had these problems, or anybody had any kind of sickness, disease, does that mean that God won't heal you? So he brings those thoughts to you. I have people bring it up all the time. They bring up about Trophimus, they bring up about Job, they bring up about uh, Paul's thorn, they try to say, which is an evil spirit that was not a sickness that was hindering him from going forth and preaching the gospel in city after city uh, and the missionary journeys. They were running him out of the town trying to stone him or, or do anything possible to stop him from preaching the gospel. No, we've got to look at the scriptures. It doesn't matter whether there's 20 people in the Bible that didn't get healed. That has nothing to do with what is available for all of us. Why? Because you've got to look at what the Word says. Psalms 103, verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. If he heals all of our diseases, that means every disease can be healed. And he's no respecter of persons. If he's healed one, he'll heal everybody. God has no respect of persons whatsoever. You've got to know, as we already saw that one scripture, but here's another one, there is no respect of persons with God. What he's done for one, he'll do for all if they meet the conditions. So he's the healer of all sickness. Now, do we have a covenant right for healing? We sure do. It was even in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. If you'll diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, do all that is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I'll put none of these diseases upon thee which are brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. This is actually a covenant keeping name. It's Jehovah Rapha. It is declaring what he will do in covenant relationship. I am the Lord. I am the covenant keeping God. And that's what Jehovah is. Jehovah is the name of God that is the covenant keeping name of the Lord. Just like he, Jehovah Sid can do is, I am the Lord your righteousness. Or some of the other ones. Jehovah Shalom. I am the Lord your peace. 
Those are all covenant-keeping names of what he will provide in that, under the covenant of the old covenant, and he also does it in the new. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Well, if we have a covenant relationship with him and we meet the conditions, does he perform his word always? Absolutely. Will he heal you? Absolutely. He just, you can't, so to think that, well, just because someone didn't get healed in the Bible, does that mean then that I can't guarantee that he's going to heal me? See, people have that to try, the devil tells them in their mind so they won't believe absolutely that God will heal them. You cannot let the lies come to you. You've got to deal with it. You've got to know that God will heal you of everything. 1 Peter 2, 24 tells us in the New Testament that this is our right. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, which we are, should live unto righteousness, that is the condition to meet, by whose stripes you were healed, meaning it's already been accomplished for you. We're healed, that's a past tense promise that's been accomplished. Healing belongs to you. You can be healed of everything. You do have to, of course, walk in his ways. And what do we see Jesus doing? Did Jesus heal everybody? No. Why? There was a reason why. But did he heal all when they met the conditions? Absolutely. Look what it says here in Matthew 8, 16. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits, not with his word, his not, not there, with speech, speaking, and healed, the, the his is not there in the Greek, and healed all that were sick. Well, Jesus healed them all. Are there other places where we see the same thing? Sure. Matthew chapter 12, and remember, he's no respecter of persons. When Jesus knew it in Matthew 12, 15, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes follow him, and he healed them all. God will heal everyone if they meet the conditions. We see it also in Luke chapter 6, where they came and they heard him. It said there, these ones came. They came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. So what happened? All that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue, or this means power, dunamis, out of him, and healed all. Everybody got healed. Everybody can be healed. God wants everybody to be healed. It's important you understand that the only thing that's going to stop it is if we don't have faith or we have a hindrance in some manner. Here's one reason, one reason why, of course, Jesus could not bring healing there at Nazareth. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, He did not many mighty works there. Why? Because of their unbelief. Unbelief will stop him because you, you receive from him through your faith and believe. The point being this, though, any thought that comes to your mind, thinking that you cannot be healed of all disease or that he will not heal you in every situation, is a lie. He's the healer of all sickness and disease. He is the healer of all who will meet the conditions because he's a covenant-keeping God. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And he is one who has no respecter of persons. As long as you meet the conditions and like not have any unbelief, he absolutely will bring healing and restoration for every single person. You must realize that. So you don't fall for any of the lies that the devil would try to bring against you. Another thing that we see is that people think that, that there's, because of their inherited generational effects, that they can't get free of those problems. Not so. Whether it's a sickness disease or whether it's a, a trait, maybe you're anger. Everybody's angry in my family. That's why I got all my anger problems. Well, you can get free of everything, remember, just because that's been a problem. I've had it all my life, I've heard people say. And so it's like the devil giving them that thought, thinking they can't get free of that. It's a lie. It is true that we have the effects from the inheritance line. 
you got to know this. This is where you got to get knowledge so you can address something in the right way. Lamentations 5, 7 says, Our fathers have sinned and are not. They've passed on and we have borne their iniquities. Well, how are we bearing their iniquities? By the inherited generational curse because of the sins of our fathers. And these go down three or four generations. We even see it. Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. The Lord is long-suffering and great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. That means you and I can have the effects of the sins of our forefathers from three and four generations back. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and even potentially great-great-grandparents, you could have the effects of their sins coming down the line. Which means, that's why you see cancer in one generation, cancer in the next, cancer in the next, or heart problems, heart problems, heart problems, diabetes, diabetes, diabetes coming down the line. Well, does that mean you're sunk from that situation? Absolutely not. You can overcome and conquer everything. Why? because these are all enforced by evil spirits. And so you gotta know that you need to cast out all these spirits and drive them all out. We have total dominion over all of the evil spirits. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 says, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they shall cast out devils. You can cast out all demons that have come into you. Now, when you start casting them out, some people think that it should just go away just like that. Not so. The devil lies to them and makes them think that, well, this should just be gone immediately. You gotta watch what you're thinking. You gotta have the knowledge of how deliverance works and how you can have a whole lot of spirits that are in you. Now, how can we have a whole lot of spirits? If it's coming down the inheritance line, it's been the sins and iniquities of the forefathers. They had a boatload coming down and now it's come into you. So you have a lot of spirits that are in you. Mental illness problems, sickness problems, any kind of problems. These are inherited generational spirits. And so is it going to just go away just like that when you cast out one or two times? No. It's going to be a process of driving the enemies out. We actually see this. And see, this is where the devil will lie to you and think that well, you can't get free. Or you go through, I've seen people go through one deliverance session and they thought they should be free because so-and-so told me, hey, you're free. <laughs> well, if I was free, why do I still have the problems? Obviously, I'm not free. But they told me I was free. Well, they told you a lie. They didn't tell you the truth. So you've got to watch what people tell you and not just believe whatever they say. Exodus 23:30, driving out the enemies out of the land, it says, by little and little, I will drive them out from before thee. It's a little by little process. Do we see that from the types in the Old Testament? Sure. Remember when they went in to possess the promised land, they had to fight against the enemies, and they had to drive them out, and they drove them out in area after area after area, city after city after city after city, which is likened to area after area in our life. And there were a whole lot of enemies and they had to keep smiting them and smiting them until they drove all the inhabitants out. Not just one battle and that was it. Even when they drove out, they thought, well, well, you know, if you just knock the big one out like Goliath, everything will be fine. No, when they knocked Goliath out, then they had to go chase all the rest of them and destroy them all. They still had to go drive them all out just because they knocked out the guy who was the strong guy. So don't think that you just knock out one thing and then it's all going to be gone. No. You're going to pursue and you're going to drive all the spirits out. It is a little by little process. And you're going to do it until you be increased, which means to bear fruit. And then you inherit the land, which is the promise of God in your life. In other words, if you think because you have been taught correctly, and this is where the lies of the devil will come in. Well, I went through a deliverance session and they told me I was free, and yet I still have the problem. Or they didn't tell you how to retain your deliverance, and you went back into sin, and now you got worse. I've talked to lots of people. Well, I went through a deliverance session, they said I was free, and everything's fine. And they didn't teach me what I should do, and now I'm in a worse shape. What happened? Well, I guess that doesn't work, so the devil tells you that lie in your mind. Now you got lies compounded, 
They told me I was free, they were wrong, so I'm not gonna go ever try that again. And then they tell you, you know, that you, you should have, shouldn't have any more problems, and of course they didn't tell you how to retain your deliverance, and you ended up sinning, and what happens? Now here you are in the same boat, in fact, you're worse this time. That's because we didn't get the true knowledge. Remember, we talked this morning, you gotta get the knowledge of God on everything. Without the knowledge of God, you'll be believing a lie. And there's many people that have been deceived about the area of healing and about the area of deliverance because they haven't been taught properly. You and I can be absolutely delivered and healed of everything, but in the area of deliverance, it's gonna be a process. You're gonna be casting out those spirits continually. Another thing that goes along with this is people say, well, they told me just to command one time the demon to come out. And they just said it, they believe it's gone. That's it. Well, if you have the knowledge of God and you look at what the Word says, you know that's not true. But if you don't, you'll just think what they told you or it should have been gone. Look what it says here in Acts 16, 18. This is an example when Paul cast the demon out of this one woman had the spirit of divination. He said, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. Did he just say it one time, as they tell you in many, many circles? And if you don't have the knowledge of God, you could believe the lie. Well, they, they command it to go. That's it. No, he didn't command it one time because the word command is present tense. What does that mean? Ongoing, continuous action. He was commanding and continuing to command ongoingly. Why was he continually to command? Because you keep releasing your faith by commanding until you see the results. And so we command continually in the name of Jesus. And how do we know it didn't come out immediately? Because it says he came out the same hour. Well, that could have been 59 minutes and 59 seconds, you know, before it finally came out. Did he just command one time and just stand there and wait for it? No. So when anybody tells you things that are contrary to the word and you don't have the knowledge of God, you'll believe a lie. And I've seen them over the years. They expected everything should be gone, just like that. Or you went through a deliverance session, expected it should, everything should be done. Or changes should happen immediately. Change doesn't necessarily happen immediately. It will happen when they're all gone, but again, you just have, you, a lot of times people just want to believe, well, God, it should, be, it should be gone right away. You're just reasoning that in your mind. It's gone when it's gone, when you've driven everything out. It is a little by little process of systematically casting everything out. And this is why we've got to get these, the knowledge of God on these things. So lies will come into your mind of course, one of the big lies is that Christians don't even have demons, which is a lie. And then, if he can't get that one through you, to you, he'll tell you, well, you might have a couple. <laughs> no, you gotta, everybody's got a boatload. Why? Because we got so much from sin from ourselves and from the inherited generational. If you don't understand generational curses are enforced by demons, we got a whole lot. And then they'll try to tell you that, well, you, okay, just command it to come out one time, it'll just leave. Or some people say, just command the big guy and all the rest will leave in one shot. Some of the people teach that stuff out there. <laughs> Is that in line with the word? No, it's law, false. They cast out, they destroyed Goliath and then they pursued after the rest of them. And they continued to do it until they had eliminated them all. When they went in and possessed the land, they took 31 kings out in Joshua. And he still said, there's still much land to be possessed. <laughs> still a whole lot more enemies in there. Obviously, it wasn't all gone. You've got to keep doing what he says, what the word says, commanding continually. This is so important for you to learn so you don't get deceived. All the demons that are in you can be driven out as you command them to come out aggressively, systematically, little by little, until they're all gone. Same with healing. You take hold of healing and pray the prayer of faith, and 
Keep speaking it into being, holding fast your confession, and you'll see the results. Well, people think, well, I prayed one time and it's, I thought it was, I was supposed to be totally healed. Or the pain left and I felt better, but later it came back. What does that tell you? It wasn't gone. All it did was shut down what was there and the effect of it. Now, why don't we know this stuff? Because we haven't gotten the knowledge of God. So what happens? Lies come into you and then you believe lies. I've talked to many people over the years that they got involved in deliverance. They didn't see results and they threw in the towel and gave it up. I've had people who got some of the books, you know, and then they returned the books, you know, because they didn't see some result. Why? Because they didn't really understand it and they didn't follow and obey what was needed to be done. We pursue them all and we cast them all out till they're all gone. But then there's ones who did take hold of it and understand it. One particular man, just give you a testimony, this is a man who had diabetes. Five people in his inheritance line all had diabetes. It was a big time generation thing. Back three generations, I think, that everybody had diabetes. So we started casting out the demons. And he was taught that, well, you just cast them out and everything will be gone and fine by some of the, the m most notable teachers in the world at that time. And we did a seminar and I taught explained all this to know this is a process. You haven't gotten the truth. You've been lied to. You've been told things that are false. It is a process of driving all these out. So he took hold of that and he started using the cast out diabetes session and started doing it day after day as we told him what to do. Keep casting them out. He did it for a year until the diabetic count came down to normal. It took that long to drive them all out. And after that now he didn't have to have any more medicine. But after that, were they all gone necessarily? No. I said keep casting them out because just because physically it's all gone doesn't mean all the spirits are gone because they can still be there and show up. So we followed directions. See, if we do what the Word says and we have the knowledge and we do it, we'll see the results. So what did he do? He kept casting out. He said, he called me up and said, the demons are still coming out of me, and yet I don't have any diabetes and every, all my tests are normal. So that's because there's still more spirits in you. And if you don't keep casting them out, what's going to happen? What remains in you will remanifest the problem. He followed directions. He kept casting out and casting out for months and months to drive all those spirits out until there was no more coming out of him. And I've seen the cases where people didn't obey. One cancer case, we were casting the demons out of, them, out of this one woman. And we cast it out to the point where she gained all her weight back. The person went, went to the doctor and they said, we don't see any more doc, any cancer in you. And I told the person, we keep casting out though, keep coming for our deliverance sessions. And they came a couple times but then they didn't want to come anymore. They said, I'm healed. I don't need to come anymore. And they wanted to go off in their ministry. They had a ministry. I said, well, in fact, they even left our church at that time. Well, what happened? The demons that were still in there came back with a vengeance. And then what happened? They filled her up, got in her liver, and she was so bad, she came and told me, I don't understand what happened. See, she believed a lie. She didn't believe about the continual casting out of the demons. She believed she was healed and didn't need to cast out anymore. And she went to all these other people and they, they would pray for her and lay hands on her and says, you're healed, it's done, that's it. And they said, I'm healed. Keep saying you're healed. When she's loaded with all these cancer spirits still, not all of them were gone. They all got driven out to the point where she gained all her weight back and they saw nothing manifest, but the ones that remained, they started working like busy little bees. Now what was the problem? She didn't have knowledge. She uh, believed the lying teaching. She believed that she was already healed. She believed they prayed one time, they said it was done, I believe that. Well, you can't just believe what you want and think it's going to happen <laughs> if it's a lie. She believed a lie. 
They came back with a vengeance. Filled her whole liver. And she lost all of her weight, went down to death's door before she showed up. What happened? She came in, I told her, she said she was angry. I don't understand why this happened. I was, you know, I was healed. And then all this came back. And I had them pray for me and they said I was healed. And I wasn't healed. Now I've got all this. She lost all her weight in death's door. What was the problem? She didn't get the knowledge of God and she believed lies. That's why we got to get the real knowledge of God. We cannot believe lies. And we need to be, in her case, she wasn't teachable. She just wanted to do whatever she wanted to do. I cast out demons that day. The demons were pouring out of her. She goes home and tells her husband, well, I do have demons in me because she could believe the lie. You see, if you don't believe correctly, the devil will deceive you and you won't conquer the enemies. And then she said, well, they tell me to go in the hospital and, go in, and uh, they're going to do some things and then after I get out, we'll, we'll start casting out again. I told her, we need to be working with you around the clock and we'll get teams of people to help you because you're at death's door and you got to get on this immediately. She wouldn't listen. She died in the hospital. Should have never happened. It's very sad. Why? She didn't have the knowledge. She rejected knowledge. Remember what we saw? They destroyed for lack of knowledge because she rejected knowledge, even though she was told that, even it was even proved in her life that it was working and the demons were pouring out of her. That shows you, we, you and I must get the knowledge of God and understand because otherwise the lies of the devil will get to you. That's why doctrine is so important. If we don't get the true doctrine, then we're going to be deceived left and right. That's what happened with her. And I'll give you another testimony. I'm just kind of sharing practical things. This is about another woman who, this woman had cancer. She went to an international evangelist meeting who had gifts of healing. And gifts of healing are great. He went to the gifts of healing and, and the person prayed, had them up on the platform, pr played, prayed for them, and all the cancer was knocked out in one shot with a gift of healing. This is someone who had quite a powerful anointing and it knocked all the cancer out. She'd been coming for deliverance. And so she went to the doctor, they checked her out, it's all gone. Found no cancer whatsoever. And I, I said to her, you know, she called me up and said, and I said, great. I said, well, look forward to seeing her in the next deliverance session. Her answer was, I don't need deliverance, I'm healed. She believed what they said, even though we were casting the demons out. I said, well, when you were in the last time, we were casting the demons out, and they were coming out of you. Well, I'm healed now, and I don't need to do that anymore. Rejected knowledge. I said, no, you still need to cast out the demons. No, I'm healed. And that was the end of the conversation. If you reject knowledge, and you don't do what needs to be done, you're in trouble. A few months later, came back with a vengeance because demons were still in her, even though she had the test and said she wasn't healed, that she did, all the cancer was gone and she was healed. Well, that's because she didn't have the knowledge of what she needed. We have to have the knowledge of the truth. Without the knowledge of the truth, we'll believe a lie. She believed lies. She believed it was all gone. She believed she didn't need to do this anymore. She believed that all the demons were, were gone automatically when she got prayed for. Healing's one thing, deliverance is another. Deliverance is casting the demons out. He didn't cast any demons out, just laid hands on her and a healing power went into her from a gift of healing. Didn't get rid of the problem whatsoever. That shows you. Again, if we don't have knowledge and we believe lies, what's gonna happen? We're gonna pay the price. Came back with a vengeance, she wouldn't come back, she died very quickly in about three months, knocked, wiped out. And then, of course, what happens? Healing gets reproach. Well, God's not a healer. Look what happened to her. She supposedly got healed. Well, she didn't get healed because now she's, she's dead. Well, she did get healed physically, but she didn't understand the other part, rejected knowledge. And because of that, then every, the whole deal 
It was a big, big thing. Well, God doesn't do that. God didn't heal her. That guy's a phony. You say all those kind of things. He wasn't a phony. He had a gift of healing. But what needed to be done didn't get done. What does this all tell you? You and I cannot afford to not get the knowledge of God and understand what the Word, what the, what the word is telling us to do. If we don't get on board on that and we just believe what so-and-so says, that's why you can't just believe what so-and-so says without checking it out in the Word. And of course, you know, they told her, that you don't need any deliverance, you're healed, that's it. And the other lady, they said, we prayed for you one time, it's done, the Word of Faith approach. Is that right? No, it's contrary to the Word. We're supposed to cast out continually. We're supposed to speak to a mountain continually. We're supposed to do what the Word says continually. We've got to understand that deliverance is an ongoing work. Praying for healing is an ongoing work. Praying without ceasing is an ongoing work. You do the Word and you're going to see the victory. And let's look at some scriptures that we looked at this morning again because they're so important for you to understand. Matthew 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. That is a command to you and me. That means I'm not just going to do it just for a little bit and that's, you know, I did my fight and that's it. No, it's a command to you and me, as we see, imperative, and it's present tense, which means you're going to continually, ongoingly fight the good fight of faith. Why do I need to keep doing it? Because there's a lot of enemies that you've got to drive out and you fight it until you see the results come to pass. What else do we do? You're going to engage in warfare. We see in 1 Timothy 1.18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before thee, that by, thou them, by them mightest war a good warfare. It's a good warfare because you'll win. And you're going to war a good warfare. If the enemy can get you to believe a lie, he's got you. If he can get you to give up and throw in the towel because you didn't see results when someone told you that you're already healed or whatever, or you saw changes and then it got, came back or got worse because they're not all driven out, like what happened in those cases with that one woman where it came back, well, what does that tell you? That tells you there's more there. But when you believe lies, you're going to be in trouble. You must understand that God will give you absolute victory. You've got to get this so established in you. Because if you think for one second that God will not give you victory, not heal you, not deliver you, not prosper you, not bless you, not give you, get you, bring you out of all bondage, you're in trouble. You're out of faith. You moved away from hope. Thanks be to God who is giving us the victory. That's an ongoing work. He is giving us the victory as we're what? Putting our faith in operation and doing what the Word says, casting out, taking hold, praying, speaking the Word, holding fast our confession, speaking things into being, continually applying our faith to see the results. And will He always do this? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. Always. You've got to have that mentality. Anybody that tells you or that comes to your mind telling you you're not always going to triumph, it's a lie. They told you a lie. Don't listen to it. God will always cause me to triumph. That means if I do what he says, I will triumph always in every situation. Absolutely. No question about it. And another scripture that we've looked at is you're to be completely victorious always in every situation. Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things we are not more than conquerors, speaking about what we are as a, a, a noun, as a fact. No, this is a verb. Here is the verb. It literally means be completely victorious, present tense. In all things, we are continually being completely victorious, ongoingly. Meaning, 
There's no defeat. There's no give up. There's no throw on the towel. There's no try another way. There's no, I guess he won't do it for me. Those are all lies. If you let those come into your mind, you just went, gave place to the enemy, and it'll shut down your faith. And, of course, what's going to happen? You're, you're going to hinder God. You can limit God and hinder him from doing what he wants to do. Just like he said, he could do no mighty works there in Nazareth because of their unbelief. Could he have done the same works in Nazareth that he did everywhere else? Sure, he could have healed them all, delivered them all. God wants us to get the truth and get so established in it. And that's going to happen in the end time church. Because this is what happened when they got on board. And this is going to happen again in Acts chapter 15, chapter 5, in verse 15. And remember, the first glory, the glory in the first church is going to happen in the end time church, but the glory is going to be greater than the end time church. They brought forth the sick in the street, laid them on beds and couches, at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Came a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Because they understood what to do. And that's what God is going to do. He will heal you. He will deliver you. He will set you free. He will help you. He will provide for you. He will bless you. Don't believe anything contrary to that. But, of course, you've got to meet the conditions, remember. Now, if you're walking in sin, you're going to shut down everything. If you get in unbelief, you'll shut down your faith. If you don't understand, it's going to be an ongoing process. And you just do it so much, and then you quit, you're not going to get the results. In fact, what's, what's the key? Consistency. Diligence, consistency gets the victory. As you're casting out, and I've seen this with people, and you're seeing, seeing some victory come, and then you kind of back off of it, well, do the demons quit and give up? No. They'll start working like busy little bees and cause the formation of the problem again. And tumor, cysts, or grows, or this problem or that problem. What's the answer? Ongoing, consistency, diligent, ongoing effort of driving out all the enemies, taking hold of healing, praying without ceasing, holding fast your confession. All these things are ongoing. Anything that tells you to do other than that, it's a lie. Anything that causes you to back off, it's a lie. Anyone thing that tells me, well, I've tried that and I've done that and I haven't seen any results, you just bought into a lie because now you're going to let go of doing what the Word says because you didn't see results when you thought it should be. You got your own mind set instead of understanding what the Word says. So the answer for us in all things, and we've covered some important things tonight, the lies of the devil will stop you from seeing God perform his word in your life. Because all the promises are already ours. And he's not holding anything back from those that walk uprightly. So what's the problem? We don't have the knowledge, or we believe lies, or we're not doing what the word says consistently and continue to do it what it needed to be done to see the victory. So many people are not getting healed. So many people are not getting delivered. So many people are suffering with mental illness problems or suffering with all kinds of hindrances because they're not doing what they need to do. And will they get anywhere? No. Not until they get on board and do what God says. But when we do what God says, you will absolutely see victory because he will always cause us to triumph. He is giving us the victory and he said we're to be completely victorious at all times. So you've got to get that mentality set in you. You know what God will do. And get diligent. You can't be lazy and slothful and think you're going to get anywhere. You've got to be diligent. Diligent, fighting, warring, conquering, doing everything that he says, casting out, doing whatever it takes. When he's, when he's commanding that demon to come out in that Acts 16, Paul just didn't command it to come out and just, uh, well, I didn't see it come out. I guess uh, 
maybe I'm not going to be successful here. No, he knew what to do. He continued to come in until it came out. It came out sometime during that hour. He didn't stop. He knew what he could do, and he knew what needed to be done, and he did it, and he saw the victory. That's the same thing with us. And what's, what's going to be the problem? If you don't have the truth, if you've got lies or you got your own mentality, your own way of thinking, or you listen to someone that's telling you contrary to the word, then the lies coming into you will shut down your faith and you'll not see the victory. Praise God. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that declares, if I continue in the word and I'm a real disciple, I will know the truth. The truth will make me free. I understand the devil changes the truth into a lie to get me away from the truth. So I don't know what to do in a situation or I believe a lie that's contrary to the word. I thank you. I'm going to get the knowledge of God. I'm going to find out exactly what the word says and I'm going to do what the word says continually and I know what God will do. He will give me the victory. I, he is giving me the victory. He will always cause me to triumph. I am becoming completely victorious. I will fight the good fight of faith. I will war the good warfare. I will cast out continually. I will hold fast my confession. I will do everything that God says. And God will perform his word. He's no respecter of persons. He will do it for me. I thank you that I will be a hearer and a doer of your word. I will never believe any of the lies of the devil. I will guard my mind and I will not listen to anybody that tells me contrary to the word. I will do what the word says and God will perform his word in my life. Thank you for always giving me the victory and that I will always be completely victorious. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you that you're helping everybody to understand the only thing that stops God from accomplishing things is lies of the devil that get in people so they don't do what he tells them to do. Thank you that we're all getting the knowledge of God. We're doing what the word says. We're eliminating all lies of the enemy. And we are believing what you say, doing what you say, and we are seeing total, complete victory in every situation. Thank you for establishing every one of us in this mentality that we won't be denied the promises. We won't be denied seeing the total victory because we know what the Word says and we have authority over all the power of the enemy and can conquer everything that he does. Thank you for every single one conquering all lies of the devil in all areas of their life so they are totally victorious in all things. Father, we thank you for accomplishing this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Well, we're talking more about...